a very warm good evening to one and all present here for the monthly seminar series of the School of Life Sciences starting from today. The main objective of the seminar is to learn new concepts in the growing body of knowledge and to learn to think critically in the vast field of life sciences to improve our research aptitude by listening to the works and experiences of eminent scientists in the field of life sciences. It also aims to build a positive environment and share the scientific knowledge among the department departments of the School of Life Sciences to carry out collaborative research work in the future. We wholeheartedly welcome the chief guest of the day, Professor Gurmeet Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Pondicherry University, Professor H. Pratap Kumar Shetty, Dean School of Life Sciences, and the speakers of the day, Dr. Gobardhan Saho, Assistant Professor, Department of Ecology and Environmental Sciences, and Dr. Rajanish Anupam, Associate Professor, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I extend a warm welcome to all the faculties, research scholars, and students of School of Life Sciences. Let us begin the event with the university anthem. I request everyone to kindly rise for the university anthem. I now request Professor H. Pratap Kumar Shetty, Dean School of Life Sciences, to felicitate our beloved guest of honor, Professor Gurmeet Singh, Vice Chancellor of Pondicherry University. I now request our beloved Dean to felicitate the speakers of the day, Dr. Rajanish Anupam, Associate Professor, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I would request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to honor them. I now request Professor Pratap Kumar Shetty again to felicitate uh, Dr. Gobardhan Saho, Assistant Professor, Department of Ecology and Environmental Sciences. Pratap Kumar Shetty joined Pondicherry University in the year 2009 and headed the Department of Food Science and Technology for more than eight years and is presently the Dean of School of Life Sciences. 
I now request Professor S. Pratap Kumar Shetty for welcoming the gathering. Good evening to all of you. Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Gurmeet Singh, my friends, speakers of the day, the opening batsman, uh, Dean Research uh, Professor uh, Tiwari, heads of the departments, my colleagues, heads of the departments, my colleagues, scholars, postdocs, and master students. It's always a pleasure to be part of uh, you know any of these academic programs. And as our Honorable Vice Chancellor always says, the academics is the heart of every institution. Students are the you know a center of the uh, this heart, and faculty are those which give and nourish this all the time. Therefore, with this intention, in fact, when I was discussing with the Honorable Vice Chancellor once, he said the academic activities of the schools needs to be, you know, more and more uh, enriched. With this intention, uh, when I uh, told him that we would like to restart this. Uh, you know the seminar series, which was to, which used to be there when I joined in 2009, sir, and in between it had stopped, and he was very happy, uh, said and saying that yes, it has to be done, and uh, then we have uh, scheduled this, sir, uh, by requesting all the newly joined faculty, that is a fresh uh, blood which came to the university, to uh, come forward and start the presentation, and I requested uh, Professor Rukmini to be the coordinator and uh, you know coordinate this, coordinate this program. And she had made a list of the uh, people who are going to present for the next one year. Our plan, sir, here uh, is to bring the faculty, scholars, students, and all the scientists together on one platform where they will listen to the, you know, they, one of their own, that is uh, one of the faculty. Or there and yeah, we are starting with the new people. And as the time goes, yes, all of us also probably get a chance to speak to all of you. In addition to that, what we are going to next time onwards, what we are going to do is we are going to have one well acclaimed scientist to be also part of this from outside the institution. They are going to come and give the talk, and after that, followed by two of our speakers. And uh, schedule will be that, sir, uh, every second Thursday of every month between 3.30 and 4 p.m., depending upon the you know, schedule at that time. Most probably it will be at 3.30 whenever there is a speaker from outside. And uh, we will try to have most of the time, most probably we'll try to have people offline. And when there is no possibility of, of offline, we have also scheduled some people to come speak from Europe because they, their time is, uh, you know, they are four or five hours ahead, uh, you know, behind us. They can also give a talk online to us. Therefore, with this plan, we have started this. As uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, our whole intention is to bring together all of us to have start having the dialogue and discussion. Sir, uh, for the benefit of all the faculty and students and also for uh, your benefit, sir, we have put uh, some vital statistics of the school. And the school started in 1984 uh, officially, although I think the, uh, the school was existent before. Officially, it started in 1984. And we are one of the largest school in terms of the number of departments. And also, we are very active in research. I think you can see it from the H-index of the uh, you know, school as well as also the citations and uh, the publications of the university. We are doing extremely well. But I would request all of us to take uh, things forward with at least one project every faculty by next year. Therefore, I would request all of you to submit at least two projects in the coming year so that at least we will have one project to each of us. And in addition to that, I would also request uh, all of you to have a collaborator from outside your department, co-investigator from outside your department, so that uh, you know that will also enrich in terms of the collaborative publication. Yes, also outside the institutions anyway. In addition to that, one more request also I'll do. Please do not publish in any of those channels which are of not of repute. Therefore, with these things, I think if we do, we will definitely climb high. Uh, as a school uh, which contributes significantly to the university in terms of its academics. And uh, uh, in addition to this, sir, uh, we also uh, would like to start some more new things which in the coming uh, year. Uh, one of the things, as I've already told you, I'm in the process of scheduling a workshop for project and publication writing. Uh, you know, with the, uh, in, I'm in consultation with the, some of the you know, scientists of DST. And in fact, we are going to have a PA, so they have requested us to do one PAC in the month of December. We are trying to share, I'm trying to schedule it one or two days before it so that some of those people who have come to the PAC of the SERB 
can be utilized for this workshop. And uh, I would, uh, I thank, uh, in fact, Dr. Rukmini for accepting this uh, assignment and uh, take this forward. And I would like to also thank uh, the two of the speakers to come as the, you know, the first speaker to come forward and uh, give their talk. And I have also requested them, they are going to give only a highlight of their background so that, uh, you know, it will be an introduction or the initiation of the dialogue. Therefore, uh, this, is, this should be only an initiation of dialogue rather than to get the entire of what somebody is doing. It is very easy today to know, uh, know about somebody. But at least to get an initiation, oh, okay, he is in, working in this area. I didn't know that. I will go and search from his web page and then start uh, surfing it forward. Therefore, uh, we have made a beginning. I would uh, like to profusely thank uh, Professor Gurmit Singh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, for agreeing to come and inaugurate this, even though it's a small program of our school. And it means a lot to us, sir, because you, uh, your words uh, will mean a lot to our faculty, students, and scholars. And uh, I would thank also to, for you for this uh, gesture. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are delighted to welcome the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Pondicherry University, Professor Gurmeet Singh. Professor Gurmeet Singh is a renowned academic administrator and an internationally reputed expert in the field of corrosion science and smart materials. Professor Singh began his academic career as an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry in So without much further ado, I call upon our beloved Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh, to convey the presidential address. Uh, <clears throat> well, friends, it's not a presidential address. It's opening remarks. That's first clarification. Secondly, uh, I saw a movie long time back. There is something comes and somebody commits a mistake and uh, then he says, uh, you better apologize to this person. And out of anger, he was not interested in apologizing, but he says, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it to such an extent that this fellow will never come to me for apology. So he says, I'm so very sorry. I will never do this again. And then after that, when one goes, on the, goes to the lunch table, he again says, I'm so very sorry, and I'll never do that. He says, okay, it's over now. Evening, he says, I'm so sorry again. And he meets somewhere. And first thing he says, I'm very sorry. I will never repeat this. And then he goes to a hotel, restaurant, and he sees him. He says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And next day, he meets in the temple or somewhere. He says, oh, no, no, let me first say sorry to you before I start my prayer. So he repeats it so many times that the fellow he gets so fed up, he says, please don't say sorry. It's enough. It's enough. And <laughs> the situation comes to such a pass, the next time when that fellow sees the chap, he runs away. <laughs> he says, he will say sorry to me. So I, I better run away from here. So the situation at one time was that he, he would never see that fellow. And anywhere he will see, even in the crowd, he will hide. He says, no, no, this fellow is going to come to say sorry again. What I am trying to drive here is, when I come here and attend one of the functions, they will say, we welcome Vice Chancellor. Done. Second one, we welcome Vice Chancellor with a shawl and whatever. Third time I go, I attended three. <laughs> we welcome. And here when I came, I thought it's a scientific talk. This will not be there again said. We welcome Vice Chancellor with a... So uh, I was thinking of running away from this, but I could not have. My suggestion to our dean was that before the person like me will say, no, no, I will not come because I know you will welcome me. So don't do this. And second, second thing was when she started, same, same thing they pick up from somewhere. And they say, Professor Gurvi Singh has joined as vice chancellor on 17th November 2017. When you are looking at something for introduction, at least read what you are going to say. So I, I hear in very many forums, Professor Gurvi Singh has taken out our Vice Chancellor on November 29th, 2017. They repeat. Rather than saying he's been serving as a Vice Chancellor here for the last about whatever, and he's done this, 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 that is enough. So same verbatim when you listen to, uh, 
it's a, it becomes a not a very encouraging, interesting thing. So, you know, it's like when we write a English language literature, anything we write, if you write again and again, I went there and I did this, and then I had lime water, and then I had uh, uh, listened to this thing. After that, and I went to the bus stop, and it becomes very same thing. We should, uh, as an academician, think of what is going to be better. So there's no need of these formalities. Yes, these youngsters are taking for the first time. Uh, they should be welcomed. They should be encouraged, which I rightly did. And I said, I'll do that again for the second speaker as well. So Govardhan Sahu and uh, uh, Rajneesh Anupam, both. I was delighted to welcome them. And when I conveyed this to the dean, he says, sir, this, since it is inaugural, we are welcoming you. After that, I ensure you will never welcome you. But that also. <laughs> So that also is a, something to be taken with a pinch of salt. Sir, this time you accept, next time we'll ensure that you're never welcome. <laughs> huh? So anyway, that's a, these are, I have a bad habit of uh, taking you to the lighter side because I know you're in for a very heavy discourse after this. Uh, the other thing which somehow I'm not able to appreciate, and I, I don't mince words, whatever I don't like, I say that, that are, we have a sizable faculty here, and two of our youngsters are going to be presenting their work. They should have been here in large numbers. This is one which is a, a bit of a discouragement, at least to me. Because after a fairly long gap, we are having this kind of a series, which is a welcome sign. I welcome this. Uh, last time I was busy, and uh, Professor Shetty said, we are inaugurating this, sir. You will have to do it. I was genuinely busy somewhere. And I apologize. I said, I can't come. Uh, then he said, can we defer it? I said, please do that. I would love to be there in the opening uh, session of this. And uh, it's a very good beginning you are doing. It should be carried on. And uh, rightly so, you have started this kind of a lecture series. We call it seminar series or whatever way you want to call it, uh, with the youngsters. And let me tell you, we have had very many youngsters who have joined our faculties. They are all very dynamic lots. Uh, when I talked to him, he said, I said, who's the first speaker? He said, Subhankar Chatterjee. I said, oh, yes, he's a, he's a humbled fellow. Good beginning we are making. But then he says, no, some of Subhankar backed out. But let me tell you, he's published a very good paper a few days back. Am I right? Which I saw, and I was very happy to see this. High impact journal paper. So this is what is required. One of the objectives of my coming here was that I would urge every youngster to apply for, Shetty said, two projects, no, apply to as many agencies you can, at least three. We have DBT, we have DST, we have UGC, we have Earth Sciences Department, Environmental Science Department, there are so many who are ready to fund you, but then we are not ready to take it. People will say, sir, I applied in UGC, I didn't get it, therefore, after that, I never applied. You know, if you start driving your car and you hit upon something, does that mean that you will never drive again? No. It's one of, the, one of the parts, that's it. So please, everybody should apply, and everybody should ensure that you get a project. Good research cannot be done without having a project. You should be on your own. Whatever you require, I'm, I'm going to make things very simple in the university. You want to buy something, just go ahead. You are the, you are the master. But here people write, sir, we have written to the PND for permission to buy chemicals. Last one month it is there. I'm going to simplify all this. Not required. Why should you be writing to something? You have got a project. It is your money. Go ahead with whatever you want. And I have seen bills not being cleared. Uh, what is the reason? Sir, they did not take permission for the purchase of these. Why should they? They have got a project. They wanted this. They are the best judges, whatever is required. So they have bought it. They are sending you a bill. Yes, after that, there should be a ample verification. Whatever has been bought should be entered in the stock register. Whosoever enters should initial it, and it should be there in your stock register as well. These are the two things, and they are always stamped at the back of the bill. Entered in the stock register on page number this by so and so, and in the stock register at this page. All these documents should be completed before this bill is cleared. I have also seen here that they took the permission all right, and when the bill has been submitted, there is no entry of any kind. The bill also did not have any address of the place. Okay, Gurmeet Chemicals, 
That's about all. Where England, America, Pondicherry, Delhi, where nothing. So such bill should not be cleared. And at the back of the bill, there's nothing. Whether it is entered into the stock register or not. To, to cut it short, save your time, I want that the procedural part which should be there from the uh, financial point of view should be fulfilled. Rest of the things will simplify. You purchase, send the bill. That's about it. No need of passing through permissions and committee and this and that. Suppose if I form a committee of having Sanskrit and economics professor for purchase of chemicals, what will they know me? What will they know about it? I am the best judge. So all that will simplify so that your research work is not hampered, is not delayed. This is what we used to do. We, after a great effort, we had simplified there wherever I was working. Same procedure, we will have it here also. So this is one. Secondly, you should all publish in good journals. I'll take two, three minutes because I don't get such a chance here in this kind of audience. Rather than publishing PEC organized a conference and you have published a paper and you would have chaired a session there, fine. Good, you go there, there is no problem. You put your point of view, you present a paper because there are neighbors. But that's about it. Their proceedings, when they include your paper, that's not a research paper. But people come here, sir, I published three papers, promote me to next CS. Please, whenever you publish, publish in a journal which is recognized, which is respected, which has some value. That is my other uh, uh, appeal to all of you. You should follow that. Third important point is that we are all here in Pondicherry University, it is one family of arts. So what uh, X is doing and what Y is doing, I should be knowing it. So especially these youngsters who have joined here, I would appreciate if the seniors can interact with them, rather than telling them, oh, I am a head of the department, don't you know I put in 40 years of service? You have just joined yesterday, you have no business to come to my room. Want to give any paper, give it in the office, it will reach me. We are all colleagues, whether you are an assistant professor or senior professor or whatever, our basic job is to teach and research. There is no differentiation. That you find in the defense, a brigadier commands a brigade and a colonel commands a regiment, that's a different thing. Their nature of job is different. Our nature of job is, if I am a professor, I am also giving a lecture and an assistant professor is also giving a lecture. So therefore, we should interact with one another. And if somebody is not able to teach anything in a very proper manner, because they are youngsters, they have come from different places, styles are different, contents are different, seniors should help them out that this is the way you should do it, this is the feedback I am getting, it is uh, a bit of it is lacking. So you need to help them out rather than moving out and saying, oh, X, he's not able to deliver in lecture, he's a useless fellow, I don't know why did he join Pondicherry University. Don't belittle. Everybody has some inherent talents. They have all come after doing all kinds of degrees that you have done it. They have also passed through all kinds of stages. Yes, they come in a different atmosphere where maybe our contents might be a little different, our style might be a little different. We may not have that kind of facilities which they would have got it in uh, somewhere wherever they have come from. Therefore, our need is the requirement is that we should discuss with them and then we should gel very well as one unit. Idea is to promote science, not to belittle somebody and to demotivate one to some extent, to such an extent that the fellow will uh, uh, never think of working anywhere, right? So this is another thing I thought I'll point it out because we don't often meet. This is a very encouraging sign you have started. I compliment Life Sciences Dean that you have started this. This is what should have been done. And I would urge all others, all other schools, to start such a thing, such, an, such a, a kind of a program, whereby youngsters can come and deliver their talks. But then it should not be only youngsters. Don't think that the old fellow, I've become a professor, I'm above all these things. They should also give a talk so that youngsters can get a lesson out of your presentations. And he rightly said, next time onwards, there'll be one very celebrated person who will be giving a talk along with one a junior, I will not call junior, a fresher, who is just a beginner in that. So these two will be there, and I would appreciate if all our faculty members, I'm saying 
concerned faculty members, if it is lifetime, I don't expect Sanskrit people to be around. Or if it is a Sanskrit seminar, I don't expect you to be there. So all relevant uh, faculty should be there as far as possible. I am not making it compulsory. Obviously, it cannot be. It is as per choice. So there was a seminar on uh, X-ray crystallography a few days back. One celebrated American came here. And uh, obviously, a person who has interest in that should have come. But here, in a seminar of this kind, if it is life sciences, as far as possible, life science faculty should be there to see what our colleague is doing. So I would appreciate if this could be kept in mind in future. I know people can have their own commitment. Somebody might have lectures. Somebody might have some other thing. All that are well taken. It's not a, there's no compulsion. But it becomes a successful program if we all attend, if students also attend. And most of the students here would be thinking that what is the purpose? Why should I be attending this? This is not in the course. Let me tell you, when you attend to this, there are many concepts which you would be clarifying yourself about when you listen to such talks. And let me tell you where these things will play a very important role. Suppose from after doing your master's degree, you go for an interview for selection into one foreign university or for selection into civil services or for that matter, banking or whatever. And they, at times, will put a question which will, the answer will emanate from such talks. Immediately it will come to you. Let me tell you, you don't need to remember. You will always get, at least I have noted this, that, oh, I heard this lecture. This is what one conveyed. And immediately you come out with an answer. And uh, one tends to do much better than what others will be doing. So for the youngster, uh, this is the purpose these lectures will serve. Not that it will be a help to you for your coursework and in scoring high marks. Scoring high marks is one side, but widening your horizon of the brain is the other side of it. So therefore, if I am a life sciences, that doesn't mean that I should not know what, what is the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I should be knowing that also. What are the reasons? How could it be sorted out? All this thing you should know, OK? But uh, this is important as far as your uh, beginning your inroad into the subject is concerned. So I'm very happy that this has been done. Uh, please continue this. Don't stop here. And don't welcome the Vice Chancellor next time when he comes. I will be there with you as far as possible again, I'm saying. I told uh, uh, Rajneesh that I would have loved to be there in your talk, but I have too many commitments today. And uh, if I stay away, then they would be losing out on this. And I will not be able to finish whatever I have to before 8.30 if I'm consistently doing that. So uh, therefore, don't think that I don't want to be here. I very much wish to be here. And I immediately asked Professor Shetty, is it being recorded somewhere? He said, yes. So I'll be able to have the occasion to listen to this talk later on sometimes and uh, would interact with them uh, what way we can help them out in this. Last one, your research work pertaining to projects would be simplified to an extent that you would love working here. That's about it. Thank you very much, and enjoy yourself. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind and inspiring words. Moving on to the scientific talk, I invite Dr. Gobardhan Saho, Assistant Professor, Department of Ecology and Environmental Sciences, Pondicherry University. Dr. Gobardhan Saho is a recipient of Geeta Mukhopadhyay Award for the best PhD thesis at CSIR National Institute of Oceanography for his notable contributions in the elucidation of biochemical signaling mechanism in the larvae of fouling organism Bellanus amphitrite. He has eight years of research experience on mangrove associate. He has eight years of research experience on mangrove-associated biodiversity, myofaunal ecology, phytoplankton ecology, biofouling and ecology of oligotrophic bacteria. He has backed the prestigious postdoctoral fellowship awarded by Government of Israel and worked at the University of Haifa in Israel as postdoctoral researcher. He has published over 10 research papers in peer-reviewed journals, and there are three popular scientific articles to his credit. 
I call upon Dr. Gobardhan Sahu to present his talk. You worked in University of Haifa, right? I have a bad habit when I hear something, I feel like telling my friends. He has worked in University of Haifa. How many of you would know what is Haifa? Nobody, isn't it? Honestly so, that's why I've come here. There is a crossing in New Delhi in front of uh, the house of Prime Minister, which used to be the house of Viceroy of uh, England when they used to be here. So that, use, that house was given to the Prime Minister. Pandit Nehru stayed in that house for about 17 years. Right in front of that, there is a crossing called Teen Murthy Chowk, Teen Murthy Crossing. So whenever I ask our friends, including defense officers, incidentally, they will I said, why this Teen Murthy Chowk? You know, there are, uh, when you come out of that house, there is one, two, three, four, five, six roads which will go, three this side and three this side, and then there's a line where this house stays. So Teen Murthy, why not six Murthy, but there are three Murthys. So why is it called Teen Murthy Chowk? They very clearly tell me, you ask any defense officer, naval, air force, police, whatever, they'll say, sir, one depicts Army, other Navy, third is Air Force. It is not so. Let me tell you, the state of Israel wasn't in existence prior to uh, somewhere around 1926. There's nothing like Israel. There was nothing like Palestinian state. There was a group of Middle Eastern region, and that's about it. There was a city called Haifa where a lot of Jews used to say, and Israel wanted to establish that as their motherland. Obviously, they were there in large numbers, and that everybody knew that would be a land of theirs, but it was not existing. They wanted to take the control of this. There is a city called Haifa. They made a number of attempts. They could not do it. They failed. And they were, every time, everybody would be defeated, in, including England, uh, English forces and Austrian forces. Then our Lancers. Lancers are horses regiment. Indian Lancers won Hyderabad, Jodhpur, and uh, Mysore. These three Lancers, they went. And in Jodhpur, there was a major called Major Shaitan Singh. Not this Shaitan Singh who fought in the 65 war, another one. He was the one who said, I will lead these Lancers, and I will capture Hefa. And they went on their horses. Haifa has a huge hilltop that you need to cross to get into the city. So they planned it in such a way that uh, they could win this battle in three days' time. That city, Haifa, was captured. After that, it was given to Israel. The state of Israel emerged gradually, which later on you will all know what is the conflict of Arab Israel. That also you should know. What led to various kinds of wars? What was the role of it? All these things are separate things. But this half a importance is, is led to the emergence of state of Israel with the help of Indian, with the help of Indian lancers. That is the importance of this. So therefore, when we took up this, when I read this history, we, with some people who mattered, we thought, why should it be named as Teen Murthy Chowk? The Britishers had named it. That doesn't mean that we continue to do that. So we have five years back. After our good effort, we named, renamed this chalk. It is now called Teen Murthy Hefa Chalk. And Israel government, though we did not have diplomatic relations with them for a long time, but subsequently we realized that we both are very important for one another. So Israel government had started giving a lot of respect to our efforts. And they are very grateful all the time that if we are there, it is because of Indian Lancers. So now when we do this, uh, day when we celebrate in Delhi, 23rd September every day. 23rd September in 1918, this war took place, and our Lancers occupied Haifa. And this is how we are we have started celebrating. And on that date, Israeli ambassador comes there. They all pay homage to the Indian soldiers who died uh, on this day. And uh, some kind of a celebration is done by the way we do it in our Indian uh, customs. And this is uh, the story of this. So I thought somebody who has done work in University of Haifa should know what is Haifa. 
Then when I questioned this to one of our uh, one of our uh, friends, you can understand, like me, heading some other universities, because he was teaching political science, and I said, what is HEFA? He said, oh, you don't know HEFA? HEFA is Higher Education Funding Agency. <laughs> the one which is supporting, and the one with the help of which we are getting all these buildings. So these are some interesting things which will, which one always remember. I said, yes, HEFA is Higher Education Funding Agency, but this HIFA is H-I-A-F-A. So there's a difference. I thought I'll give you a brief on that. That's about it. Good evening to one and all. So now, I'll speak about uh, one interesting story that is about biocommunication in Barnacle, that is Balanus Amphitrite. So basically, when you visit any rocky uh, shore, rocky beach, or maybe you are uh, traveling by a boat or ship, so you might have noticed this tiny organism that is hardly around two centimeter in diameter. Uh, on the bottom of the boat, or maybe on the surface of the rock. But you'll be surprised to know that there is a multi-billion dollar anti-fouling industry existing for this, for this tiny organism that is actually, most of the time, it goes unnoticed. So this, uh, these barnacles, actually, these are the dominant fouling organisms in tropics and subtropics. So fouling means that is the undesirable attachment to any man-made structure. That can be a ship hull, that can be a oil platform, that can be any seawater intake pipes. So from San Francisco Bay, uh, there was one survey that uh, out of 22 container ships, it was found that 80% was fouled by barnacles. From this, it is clearly apprehended that uh, barnacles are the dominant organisms in the fouling community. And as per one estimate, by US Navy alone, uh, for this biofouling, they spend around 180 to 260 million US dollar per year. And that is only for extra fuel consumption. So that means one, when these organisms they get attached to the ship hull, the speed of the vessel decreases because of increased hydrodynamic drag. So the more, more fuel consumption, there will be more uh, emission of carbon dioxide. So if you convert this, uh, uh, US, US dollar into Indian rupee, it will come around 1,200 to 1,500 crore. So that is quite huge. And that is, I'm talking about US Navy alone. So if you consider the world fleet together, actually you can imagine how much budget we are putting on maritime industry. So coming to the life cycle of this barnacle, basically the adult barnacle fertilized eggs are hatched from the mantle of the barnacle and uh, nucleus larvae comes out. Once nucleus larvae comes out, 
It is actually planktonic, so it feeds, feeds some phytoplankton from the water column and it grows. So after six moltings, it gets transformed into a stage that is called separate stage. So that separate stage, it is morphologically as well as physiologically quite different from the nucleus stage, you can see. And this separate stage, it is non-feeding stage. So that means it has to depend on its own energy reserve. So once energy is over, then it has to die. So before that, it has to settle. So its main intention is to find out a suitable home, suitable habitat, or suitable substratum. So once it finds a suitable substratum, it gets attached. So that is called attached separate. So this attached separate gets converted into an adult. So that means this barnacle, it has two phases. One is benthic phase, one is pelagic phase. And this nucleus stage, as well as separate stage, it can swim in the water column. But adult stage, as well as attached separate, it actually remains stationary on a substratum. So that means I told you that uh, cypripedes are the settling stage. So that plays uh, plays a critical role in the life history of the barnacle. So these cypripedes, it has antennules which is supplied with mechanoreceptors as well as chemoreceptors. So basically, these receptors help in the exploration process as well as finding a suitable substratum. So why to study these biochemical uh, biochemical signals or biocommunication signals? So here is the here is the animation that uh, sh shows that if there is a positive signal from the substratum, this barnacle larvae or cypripede gets converted into juvenile and that grows into an adult. So that means that positive signal can be targeted in future. If we can identify that posit positive signal, we can uh, target that positive signal. If it is a negative signal from any substratum, so that negative signal can be harnessed and used for antifouling. So barnacles are actually, they are gregariousness. So that means they live in groups. Why do they live in, they live in groups? Because you can see that uh, in the picture, that one barnacle is copulating with another barnacle. They are actually cross fertilizers. So basically, this, uh, uh, this adult barnacle is stationary. So that means the barnacle, where it has to settle, it has to be decided during the separate stage. Once it is settled, it cannot move. So for future reproduction to make it successful, the barnacles, uh, cypripedes, they have to selectively uh, choose a site. That may be wherever their conspecifics or own relatives are there, they have to select. And that is also within the range of male reproductive organ. Otherwise, if one barnacle is here and other barnacle is far away, they cannot reproduce. And the future of the barnacle population will be in trouble. The second picture says that, uh, a plume of chemical signals coming out from the barnacle. Those are mainly waterborne signals. So basically, it narrows down the search area. Because ocean is vast, so to narrow down the search area, so plume of chemical signals are released from the barnacle. So once these larvae, which are swimming in the water column, they come across this signal, they will move towards the barnacle population or, or their own relatives. And once they touch, a tactile chemical signal that is present on the barnacle shell that is called settlement inducing protein complex. So that is a chemotactile Q or signal. So then they will undergo metamorphosis. So that means there are two types of signal. One is waterborne signal, one is surface associated signal or chemotactile signal. So in 2002 to 2006 by Kondefarker et al. So they found that this barnacle also harbor some specific biofilm bacteria or epibiotic bacteria, that also can induce larval metamorphosis of Balnas amphitrite. So that means barnacles decide what kind of epibionts it will harbor. So but if you take any, if you take any biofilm from euphotic zone, particularly in ocean, so you'll not, it will not be composed of bacteria alone. There will be diatoms, there will be fungi, there will be protozoans. So my first objective was to find out what kind of diatoms are actually present on the barnacle shell. So this is a typical uh, Balanus amphitrite population from uh, uh, west coast of India, Goa. So what I did, I did one uh, scanning electron microscopy of barnacle shell to know what is exactly on the surface of the barnacle shell. So this is an intact barnacle. When the surface of the barn barnacle shell or the biofilm was removed, 
the shell looks like this. But with biofilm, when scanning electron, electron microscopy was carried out, it is fully covered by two dominant diatoms. You can see it is fully covered. You can't see the shell also. So first one is Echnanthes longiface. The second one is Melocera pneumoloides. Those are two diatoms. So if these two diatoms are found epibiotically on the surface of the barnacle shell, probably barnacle cell might have some role on the growth of these diatoms. So to know that, we designed one experiment uh, in that the medium actually was supplemented with crushed barnacle shell. So one we used, that is filtered seawater. The second one is a by 2 medium that is widely used for diatom culture, that is a enriched medium. So that, has, that is actually having sufficient quantity of nitrogen, nitrate, and phosphate. So in the result of both the diatoms, what I found that growth of both the diatoms was significantly higher in the presence of crossed barnacle shell. So that indicates that barnacle shells pro probably provide surface area for diatom attachment, or maybe barnacle shell, the protein present in the barnacle shell, that also uh, may be used as a nitrogen source for the diatoms, or maybe barnacle shell, it has some specific biochemical signal for diatom settlement that is not known. So if they are found on the surface of the barnacle shell, so then what is their role on the diet, uh, on the separate metamorphosis of Balanos amphitrite? So we designed one experiment to extract different, sig uh, that, uh, that is called culture supernatant that actually, uh, that has waterborne signals and biofilm. Biofilm actually, it has tactile signals. So both the diatoms were cultured without, uh, in the absence of barnacle shell, as well as with barnacle shell, to know actually what the secret when shell is present, barnacle shell. So the culture supernatant actually, uh, it has waterborne signals, and the biofilm, it has tactile signals. So both the culture supernatant as well as biofilm, they were processed separately for both the diatoms, and they were sonicated, centrifuged, and filtered through a 0.22 micron filter paper, and concentrated then they were used in the uh, they were exposed to cyprid whether cyprid undergoes metamorphosis or not that was carried out under microscope so exactly the culture supernatant as well as biofilm exopolymer what it contains the composition chemical composition here actually the sugar composition was carried out by R rplc that is uh, reverse phase uh, liquid chromatography so the so here, the most important results are that irrespective of the presence or absence of the barnacle shell, you can see here, irrespective of the presence or absence of the barnacle shell, these uh, biofilm exopolymers of both the diatoms, it is dominated by N-acetyl glucosamine, that is NAG, 98% is 99, 98, 98. So it is dominated by N-acetyl glucosamine, but here, in the echnanthes longiface, you can see in the culture supernatant particularly, the arabinose concentration, it is uh, 34, here it is 34, almost same, but the concentration in the presence of the barnacle shell, actually it is 19 percentage, here it is 32 percentage. So that is almost doubled. Almost doubled, but in case of Melocera pneumolides, again in the culture supernatant category, so Trehalose concentration, it is also doubled in the presence of the barnacle shell. So that is the difference. So sugars, I, I, I actually carried out a sugar composition analysis because sugars play an important role in the separate metamorphosis because sugars, they have uh, OH groups, particularly glucose or fructose or whatever. So they have uh, polar groups. So that polar groups actually interact with the polar groups of the separate antennule that gives a strong adhesion, binding, attachment. So sugars are not the only component in the extract. So there will be uh, like proteins or some other component also that also might influence. So to know that, we have I have done one FTIR, that is Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy of both the extract. So what I found that it also contains proteins. So from the peptide bond vibration that can, uh, that can be known from FTIR, so it also contains proteins. But the difference is that aliphatic hydrocarbons, 
aliphatic hydroca hydrocarbons, they are long chain hydrocarbons, and thiols, that is SH group, they were mainly detected in the culture supernatant and BE only in the absence of the barnacle shell. That means barnacle shell actually influences the composition of the extract. So in the absence of the barnacle shell here, so aliphatic hydrocarbons and thiols were detected, but in the, in the presence of the barnacle shell, these compounds or these groups of compounds were not detected. So coming to the Melosira pneumolides, that is another diatom, again proteins were present. But aliphatic hydrocarbons were detected in the culture supernatant only in the absence of the barnacle shell, not in the presence of the barnacle shell. So then thiols were synthesized in culture supernatant, so irrespective of the presence or absence of the barnacle shell. So barnacle shell actually uh, could not influence here. And again in the benthic or biofilm exopolymer, that presence or absence of the barnacle shell didn't show any variation in the biofilm exopolymer. So both the peak are same. So coming to, coming to the results actually, the diatom, uh, culture supernatant and biofilm exopolymer, how it influenced the metamorphosis. So in the y-axis, is, this is actually metamorphosis percentage. X-axis, this is uh, treatments. So that is a positive control. That is uh, at, from adult extract, from adult barnacle. That is a negative control that is filter seawater without any signal. So here, in the absence of the barnacle shell, culture supernatant and biofilm exopolymer of both the diatoms here, actually it inhibited. So that is mainly because of aliphatic hydrocarbons, because aliphatic hydrocarbons, these are the long chain hydrocarbons without any polar groups. So probably, uh, that uh, actually that reduces the strength of the attachment. So for that actually, cypreids they avoid. So again in the, uh, that is uh, biofilm exopolymer of Echnathes longipes as well as Melosira pneumoloides here, in the presence of the barnacle shell, it actually promoted metamorphosis. That means actually barnacle shell and diatom, they actually interact in a complicated manner for uh, larval settlement of Balanus amphitrite. So culture supernatant of Echnathes longipes here in the presence of barnacle shell, actually it inhibited. So as per the statistical analysis, it inhibited. So it inhibited because of dominance of arabinose, because arabinose actually, it is a pentose sugar, so it has five OH groups. So probably those sugars which give better attachment, they will prefer those kind of sugars. So those sugars actually act as a signaling molecule. So in case of culturing, uh, culture supernatant of Melosira pneumoloides here, that actually promoted. That is because trehalose concentration increased and trehalose is a trisaccharide. So that actually it has a lot of OH groups. So coming to the second part, that is actually once the uh, barnacle larvae, they perceive any kind of metamorphic signal or exogenous signal, then the next step is that it has to process internally. So there are a uh, lot of neurotransmitters as well as hormones. So here basically I'll be talking about two important endogenous signals. One is nitric oxide, the second one is serotonin. And both the signals actually interact in an antagonistic manner in balanus amphitrite. So what is known in case of balanus amphitrite, nitric oxide, it is actually, it is a known natural inhibitor. But in, in case of serotonin, it is a known natural promoter. So it promotes nitric oxide inhibits. And both the signals are present within the body of the barnacle larvae. And from one paper, what I found that nitric oxide basically modifies the serotonin structure so that it cannot bind, bind with serotonin receptor. So this is what you can see. So in, uh, the nitric oxide signaling cascade actually starts when L-arginine gets converted into L-citrulline in the presence of nitric oxide synthase one or two. So it is present in two different isoforms and nitric oxide is released. So once nitric oxide is released, then it activates guanylyl cyclase, and this guanylyl cyclase actually converts GTP to CGMP. And CGMP, once it remains in elevated level in, inside the cell, so it can activate protein kinase G, and that protein kinase G actually phosphorylates several proteins required for the inhibition of metamorphosis. But the exact mechanism is not known, what kind of proteins and other things. So once the signal is passed over, Next step is that there, are, there is one more group of enzyme that is called phosphodiesterase. So phosphodiesterase, it has to degrade CGMP. 
So phosphodiesterase is present in three, uh, there are 11 isoforms, but five, six, nine, it is very specific for CGMP. So because of that, I targeted only five or six or nine. So the working hypothesis here is, if I'll inhibit this nitric oxide synthase, nitric oxide will not be released. So that means if nitric oxide will not be released, there will be a promotion in metamorphosis because nitric oxide actually inhibits. So in other way, if I degrade phosphodiesterase by different compounds, pharmacological compounds, so then CGMP will remain, in, uh, remain at a higher level. The elevation of CGMP will be higher. So because of that, this pathway will continue and there will be an inhibition in separate, meta separate metamorphosis. So that is the working hypothesis. So in the methodology section, I, uh, I targeted different uh, enzymes, nitric oxide synthase one or two by pharmacological compounds. One is severe nitroindazole, that is a specific inhibitor of NOS1. SMIS, that is S-methyl isothiourea hemisulfate, that is for NOS2. And there is a non-specific inhibitor that is called geldanamycin that can inhibit NOS by inhibiting HSP90, that is a molecular chaperone. So similarly, phosphodiesterase 5 was inhibited by sildenafil, phosphodiesterase 6 was inhibited by dipyridamol, and base 736691, it was inhibited by, uh, uh, it, it actually targeted phosphodiesterase 9. So the conditions was that tropical temperature that is 25 degrees centigrade, it, uh, then salinity 35, and light and dark cycle was 12 is to 12 hour, and uh, the separate metamorphosis observation was carried out every day up to four days. So here are the results. So what I found that I had told you in the first working hypothesis, if the NOS1 or 2 will be inhibited, there will be a promotion in metamorphosis because nitric oxide will not be generated. So that is how it is from 25 to 100 micromolar concentration of 7 nitroindazole actually it promoted. But in case of SMIS, that is here. So actually day one, there was not much promotion, but day four, it was a weekly inductive, weekly promotory. So that is mainly, probably could be sl uh, slow uptake of drugs or larval energetics, because energy of the larvae actually, it has a finite reserve. So that also plays an important role. So in case of geldanamycin, 0 0.1 micromole, actually it promotes separate metamorphosis. So here actually, although it is an indirect method, but one thing is clear that NOS1 NOH2 as well as HSP90 are involved in the nitric oxide signaling of the cyprids. So then phosphodiesterase inhibitors, I had told you in the working hypothesis that if uh, phosphodiesterase is degraded, CGMP will remain at elevated level, then uh, it will lead to inhibition in metamorphosis. But in case of dipyridamol and uh, base 736691, you can see there is a promoter, promotion in metamorphosis that means these are the compounds or these are the enzymes are not involved. So what is involved? Sildenafil, that is phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So you can see phosphodiesterase 5 actually, uh, it is involved in a separate metamorphosis. So to know whether phosphodiesterase 5 is actually expressed in the separate or not, we have done one immunodetection assay. So that is the indirect radio uh, immune detection assay. That means there is a uh, primary antibody, there is a secondary antibody. So you can see the cyprids actually almost there are no fluorescence or little fluorescence in the control as well as, you know, in the uh, uh, cyprid also can show some autofluorescence, but there is not much strong fluorescence. But strong fluorescence I, I, I got when the cyprids were treated with primary antibody as well as secondary antibody that clearly says that uh, phosphodiesterase 5 is actually involved and expressed in the central nervous system that is in the brain region of the cyprid. So coming to the second, uh, 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 that nitric oxide and serotonin, whether they actually interplay in balanos amphitrite. So I have done one indirect assay again. First, nitric ox uh, uh, cyprids were exposed to a solution of nitric oxide donor that is sodium nitroproside. So that solution actually keeps on releasing nitric oxide. So that uh, then they were exposed to a positive signal that is serotonin. I had told you it promotes metamorphosis as well as adult extract. That is a control again. So in the second step, first 
the uh, serotonin signaling of the barnacle larvae or cypreid, it was blocked by a compound that is called ketanserin. Then they were exposed to severe nitroindazole as well as SMIS because these are the compounds. It reduces nitric oxide level and it promotes metamorphosis. So there are different ways. So then uh, cypreid metamorphosis observation was carried out. So what I found that when cypreids were exposed to sodium nitroposide solution that is a known nitric oxide donor, and then they were exposed to a positive signal, there was a promotion in metamorphosis. So here, the results. So that indicates the inhibitory effect of nitric oxide can be masked when the pelagic larvae touches a metamorphic signal or a positive signal. So again, here, if the serotonin signaling is blocked by a compound, then we are trying to reduce the nitric oxide level still it does not promote cypreid metamorphosis. That means for cypreid metamorphosis to occur, nitric oxide level has to come down and serotonin level has to go up. So this is actually shown in a schematic diagram. So when the cypreids are in water column, so nitric oxide level is, uh, uh, it, it is at elevated level. So serotonin level is low. But once cypreid of balanus amphitrite or barnacle, it senses a particular substratum or home, then nitric oxide level has to come down, serotonin level has to go up. That actually prepares itself for settlement or metamorphosis. So coming to my summary and conclusions that uh, uh, I think it is clear that uh, balanus amphitrite, it decides what kind, of, what kind of epibions it will harbor. So here actually it harbors two dominant diatoms, that is Acranthes longipes and Melusira nummuloides on its shell, and exopolymers of these diatoms actually in the presence of the barnacle shell, actually it promotes cypreid metamorphosis that indicates that is, there is a complex interaction between diatom as well as shell. So nitric oxide synthase one also is involved, apart from nitric oxide synthase two. So phosphodiesterase five, that is the first report uh, that uh, it plays an important role in the metamorphosis process of any marine invertebrate, and uh, since it actually inhibits metamorphosis, so it has anti-fouling potential. So particularly here I want to highlight that in Ayurvedic medicine also there are some compounds uh, that can target phosphodiesterase 5. So my next step is to uh, use those compounds and uh, check whether it can be used as an uh, anti-fouling solution. So biochemically nitric oxide and serotonin interplay decide the fate of the barnacle larvae that actually determines the uh, population structure in the benthic habitat. Okay, thank you. Sir, uh, these epibiotic diatoms, there are some specific host, uh, specific diatoms are there, but particularly these diatoms, they are also found in water. Water as well as other kind of substrata, but uh, when they're present in, uh, particularly on uh, surface of any kind of organism, they interact in a different manner, physiologically. Thank you, Dr. Gobardhan Sahu. Now I invite Dr. Rajanish Anupam, Associate Professor, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Dr. Rajanish Anupam is a molecular vi virologist who holds a PhD degree in Biochemistry, Molecular and Cellular Biology from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Ohio University in 2007. 
He has worked as a postdoctoral research fellow and research scientist at the Ohio State University for more than five years before joining as an assistant professor in the Department of Biotechnology at Sagar Central University in 2013. His research interest is to mainly understand the contribution of viral genes in the viral pathogenesis and to target the essential viral host interactions to develop antiviral drugs. He is also interested in exploring the potential of garlic organosulfur compounds as novel antibacterial agents against drug-resistant bacteria. He has more than 20 publications in highly reputed journals. I now request Dr. Rajneesh Anupam to present his talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, right at the onset, I would like to congratulate our uh, School of Life Sciences Dean, Professor Shetty, for organizing this seminar series. And I would also like to thank uh, our VC uh, for coming here and encouraging our initiative. And I also want to thank him again that uh, at the age of 44, I have been called as uh, new faculty, young faculty, fresh blood. So that's a good thing, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, talk about my uh, research. Here, I uh, will talk about molecular virology, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background of my postdoctoral work, which led into the work that I'm, I did uh, before coming here, and uh, some of the future aspects that I want to uh, focus on in my future. So uh, I know virology is uh, something that is uh, not so popular, I wouldn't say, with the COVID and the pandemic, the virus research and virology has come into the front. But uh, as the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind, and viruses and bacteria, especially even bacteria, when you culture them, you can see them, you know? So, but with viruses, that is not the case. So viruses, they are in the background and they are as significant as any other thing in the nature and they contribute to a lot of things. They shape our economy. I, would, I don't have to say much about all these things because we already are experiencing what a small virus that you cannot see can affect your life from your uh, mental health to your uh, budget, you know. So all of that is viruses for you. So uh, let me just give you a very, very simple introduction about viruses. So what is viruses made up of? They are made up of mainly two things. That is the genome, and the genome is covered with a capsid of proteins, okay. So very, very simple. But uh, it will have, most of the viruses have very, very, a few genes, very handful of genes. Your HIV has around 15 genes. Even your uh, SARS-CoV-19 has somewhere around 20 genes. But can you imagine the power of such a simple virus where it can tackle an uh, organism which is having around more than 25,000 genes, such a complicated immune system, but still it is having the ability to outsmart such a developed organism and bring it to its knees. So there is uh, always that uh, uh, simplicity, but still it is very, very complicated for you to understand. If you think about viruses, they cannot do anything by themselves. So that is the reason they are you know, obligatory intracellular parasites. When I say they are obligatory intracellular parasites, they get into your cell, they use everything that you, uh, your stuff, to work against you, you know? So, of course, there are a lot of viruses that are good for you. I'm not gonna get into all that right now. So we are just going to concentrate on the viruses that cause diseases, okay? So to further uh, talk about a little bit basics about your viruses, and I'm c trying to keep this uh, talk a very cursory overview of what I do. You know, I'm not going to go into too much of detail. So here you can see that a typical life cycle of a virus, attachment, entry, replication, assembly, and release. So to do all these basic life cycle of a virus, the virus proteins, as I told you, there are only very handful of genes that you have and a handful of proteins. Those have to do a lot of complicated stuff, make more copies of them, modulate your host immune response, change the cellular environment of the host cell so that the virus can replicate. So they have to interact with your host. So that is the whole area of host microbe interaction or host viral interaction or host pathogen interaction. So uh, we are studying that area or my area is to study those kind of interactions with uh, different, different uh, outcomes or effects. So if you think about it again, pathogenesis, host system, uh, host immune system modulations, but there are a few challenges that are associated with virology research, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, those challenges are, first of all, it is, 
the viruses are very very small in nano nano scale you know so you cannot see them and uh, handling something that you don't see is obviously difficult it is very easy to uh, study something that you see and whenever you are studying something the basic things that you want to see is that what is the shape what is the morphology how does it grow and all these things those are, those all get very difficult when it comes to viruses so that is one of the biggest challenges and for looking at your virus, you need sophisticated equipments that involves, again, money and uh, uh, facilities that require a lot of uh, capital, okay? And uh, the other thing is that you need a host. Basically, without host, a virus will not propagate. So, the, again, when you're talking about host, it can be, a, uh, there are different hosts, you know, you can have uh, animal hosts, you can have cells, cell culture facility is very, very important. And without these basic uh, cell culture facilities, doing virology research is a little bit difficult. And the other thing is that you have biosafety concerns, okay? So if you're working with a pathogenic virus, let's say Ebola virus, you can only work in two places in India. One is in Bhopal, another one is uh, at NIV. No, you cannot work. Even though you want to work with Ebola, you will not be able to work, you know? Even though you are an expert in Ebola, unless and until you have a BSL-4 facility, you cannot work. And BSL-4 facility takes, at, uh, the establishment of BSL-4 facility will take crores of rupees, you know. So it's not a simple uh, concept because of the biosafety concerns. So what is molecular virology? Basically, we are trying to understand the role of viral genes and proteins in the viral life cycle spread and pathogenesis. So how do you do that? Most of the times it is done by reverse genetics where we try to mutate a particular protein. As you can see that there are there is a protein, I put an X mark, I'll try to remove it or do mutations in it and try to see how the viral life cycle or the above three points are affected and try to understand that. Or we can also use other techniques such as molecular biology techniques, biochemical techniques, proteomic, genomic techniques and make molecular <coughs> make, excuse me, make molecular clones of the virus and try to understand the, uh, I'm going to take, you can also take a particular viral gene and express that in a, pro, in a cell and try to see what it does. So these are some other ways of studying, you know, molecular virology. The case study that I'm going to present is a little bit of my postdoctoral work where we have started with uh, proteomics work and I'm going to give you a very brief overview of that and how that has led to, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, and I already have one, thanks. And how that has led to the work that I've been doing and uh, I'll give you an overview of uh, what things are. So the virus that I used to work when I was doing my postdoc is HTLV-1 and uh, that is human T lymphotrophic type 1 virus. And uh, it is uh, the first discovered retrovirus. Not a lot, lot many people don't know. Uh, when we talk about retrovirus, everybody thinks about HIV. But this was the first uh, retrovirus that was discovered before HIV. So very similar to HIV. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. It is a causative agent of uh, adult T-cell leukemia and some neuro, neuro inflammatory diseases. And there are a lot of other things. So the reason why a lot of people are interested in this virus is that it is a very good model system to study uh, cancer biology or development of cancer or oncogenesis. So that's the reason this is called as um, uh, uh, oncogenic virus, you know, retro-oncogenic virus. And uh, the focus of my research is uh, on a particular protein that is called as P30, which is an accessory protein. And here also you can see there are only a handful of genes, but still we don't know. There is no cure for the ATL disease that is caused by HTLV. And if you have it, uh, ATL, then uh, the, the, the chances of your morbidity are almost all 100%. There is no, uh, what do you say, cure for ATL that is caused by HTLV. So uh, what we wanted to see is that actually my uh, postdoc project was very, very simple. You know, It was like uh, express this protein and uh, try to see its post-translation modifications, especially uh, the phosphorylation. So I'll start with that. My talk will start with that. And it'll end with the same thing, OK? But in between, I took a detour. I'm going to talk about that detour. So. How I did this, you know, so I was trying to express this protein in the cells, not in bacteria, obviously, because post-translation modifications, you want to express it in eukaryotic cells. So while I was doing that, I was not getting much success. So it took another route. I'll tell you about that in a little bit, you know, in my later slides. But uh, I have tagged this protein with an S tag, expressed a lot of it, okay, 
and uh, did an affinity purification. That means I have beads and on that beads I have another part of that S tag and the S tag that is on my protein and on the bead have lot very high affinity. That is the reason it is called as affinity purification. So all the P30 would come down and it would bring along all the cellular proteins it would interact with. So I perform a proteomics or shotgun proteomic analysis and try to understand that all the host proteins to which your P30 is going to interact. So once we did that uh, experiments, this is the complicated you know, host protein interactome analysis that we have done which we have published in retrovirology. So the, there were lots of proteins that it interacted with but one protein stood out and that was this protein. Uh, so P30 specifically interacts with Reg Gamma. So once we got that results, this was the top hit among all that uh, uh, hundreds of proteins that P30 interacted. And uh, that is your Reg Gamma protein. It actually is a, a nuclear proteasome activator. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that we are now uh, uh, came to a candidate protein that is interacting with P30. So here what I talked talk, talk to you about a little while ago, we are trying to understand the host viral interaction so we have a candidate. Now the second thing that we have to determine once we have these candidate, this is a, just a western blot, immunoprecipitation, reverse IP to confirm whatever we found in our uh, uh, proteomics approach. So now what once we have this, the second obvious question is that does this interaction required for viral replication, if not then what it is required for. So for that we did a very simple, uh, again, uh, reverse uh, genetics where we have knocked down uh, Reg Gamma and uh, looked at uh, viral replication. You can see that uh, when we knock down Reg Gamma the viral replication does not change. So uh, this interaction is not required for replication. But what we found that it was required for survival of infected cells. I am not going to go into all that details but there is some other uh, what you say purpose of that interaction and we found that and that is what published in another paper you know so in addition to that what we have also seen is that uh, p30 specifically interacts with prmt5 and the prmt5 is protein methyl arginine transferase 5 and it has a role in epigenetic modifications that's the reason i was talking to dr arun about this and we were thinking about doing something you know so hopefully that will lead into some kind of collaboration okay so here again what we have seen is that p30 specifically interacts with prmt5 so again we wanted to ask the same question does this interaction required for viral replication and we found here you can see on the right hand side of the slide when you knock down prmt5 there was no change in the replication of the virus as you can see that viral proteins were expressing very nicely through western blot and ELISA analysis. So here what we have determined that there are two interactions that are happening with P30 protein but those two interactions are dispensable when it comes to viral replication. Maybe they have another role maybe modi uh, modulation of P P53 gene because PRMT5 actually modulates P53 so maybe that is going on. So there are lots of avenues to investigate or take this work forward but at least you will know that what are the interactions that the uh, viral proteins are making with host proteome and how, what, are, what are the roles of those uh, interactions and how can we target those interactions by using small molecules to inhibit these interactions which are crucial for viral replication spread or modulating the host system for facilitating viral replication. So with that when I moved to India uh, so this was my whole idea and there was very big bottleneck when it comes to P30 because P30 is a protein that is expressed in a very very low quantities and HTLV1 protein and P30 were discovered almost all three decades back. Now it has become four decades. But nobody was able to express this protein in large quantities in bacteria so that we can do these kind of studies that I've highlighted here such as structural biology, function, host viral interaction or how to target that protein. So that was the would you say the challenge that I took up try to uh, express this protein you know and uh, we had some clues that expressing this protein in bacterial system was not tried because this protein is very very unstable the expression levels of this protein in infected individuals is very very low and we do not uh, nobody has ever seen it at a protein level only evidence that this protein exists is from uh, viral uh, or oh, sorry mRNAs are found of this protein in patients 
and you have antibodies against this protein in patients and uh, if you remove this protein, again the reverse genetic approach, people have deleted this protein from the molecular clone of HTLV and infected animal models and the infection was not very good and it was not persistent. So we knew that it is important for viral infection and persistence but we did not know why and how. So expressing this in large quantities was something that I wanted to do. So what we have done is that we have taken a bacterial expression plasmid which already has a GFP. So we swapped out GF, GFP with P30. So that, that we call as a swap clone. And then we also made a chimeric protein where we put P30 uh, or we put uh, GFP on the C-terminal of P30. So these are the two clones. So one is insert clone we call, one is swap clone. Swap clone is we swapped it for GFP. So P30 would be expressing by itself and in other one it would be expressing as a chimeric protein. The idea of using GFP and trying to make this chimeric protein was P30 was unstable, we knew that. So there was literature saying that if you tag something with GFP, it helps it to stabilize. We were not sure whether it would work or not, we wanted to give it a try. And the other thing is that whenever you are having GFP, the, pro if the protein whichever is attached to GFP, if that folds properly, then it would not affect the folding of GFP and GFP would also fold nicely and give you fluorescence. If your uh, uh, tagged protein is not folding properly, that would affect the folding of GFP, then you would not get fluorescence. So we wanted to use that to study the expression of this protein in the bacteria using flow cytometry, which is not done very often. The bacterial flow cytometry is not done, but that will help us to understand a lot of things and that actually did, you know. So as we expected, P30 actually stabilized GFP, oh, sorry, GFP actually stabilized P30. As you can see, wherever I said that only swap clone where we expressed P30 by itself, we did not get any expression. But as soon as we tagged it with GFP, we had very nice expression. This is whole cell lysate. And you can also see that whenever you have, uh, we used T7 promoter system. So T7 promoter usually is a leaky promoter, so uninduced cells also you can see that there is a GFP positive bacterial cells. And whenever we are, uh, uh, what do you say, there is good signal that is coming from these uh, bacterial cells. That means that your P30 is folding properly and that folding is not affecting the folding of GFP and GFP is fluorescing and is soluble and you are getting signal. So the idea of using P30 and GFP uh, as a chimeric protein actually worked and you can see from your flow cytometry data that P30 is expressed when it is tagged to GFP and it is in soluble form. Then only you would see the signal, you know, both in induced form and uninduced form. Huh? So, but as soon as we were lysing the cells, it was going into insoluble fraction, which you can see in the bottom panel of left-hand side. So, we were not understanding. With flow data, it is showing that it is soluble. But as soon as we are lysing the cells, it was going into inclusion bodies, okay? So, we didn't understand what was going on. So that's the reason whatever we are doing right now here is to familiarizing our research with everybody else here. So this uh, similar stuff happened. I was sitting in microbiology department with one of my colleagues in my previous university. He is an assistant professor in Manit now. He also moved out of from there. So I was talking to him about all these things and I said that I think this is because my protein is a peculiar protein and I'll tell you why it is peculiar because there are unusual amino acids and I did some experiments in my postdoc, try to answer that, but nothing really came out of it. And I said that I need a good bioinformatician to understand what is going on because the things are not good. And he suggested that, oh, I have a friend, He, we both did uh, our uh, a PhD from CDRI in the same institute, so why don't you contact him? And he well, you know, called him right in front of me, and his name is Trimitri Pati, and he is in Nehu. Okay, so, and I spoke to him and I was like, this is what is happening, I think, you know, can you do some kind of analysis and tell me that what is happening with my protein, why this thing is there. So he said, oh, maybe it is an IDP and that's what I'm going to tell you now. And he said, send all the information and I'll do some bioinformatic analysis. So, now what we have seen after the bioinformatic analysis is that P30 has a lot of uh, destabilizing or uh, disorder causing amino acids and not order causing amino acids. So you can see here that that is the distribution and most of this is bioinformatic stuff. If you ask me, uh, maybe I'll be stumped, but you know, so I'll explain as, as uh, how much ever I can. So you can see here that there are a lot of serines 
and serines are disorder promoting. There are a lot of lysines, they are disorder promoting. There are a lot of arginines and the PI of this protein is 11.7. That means it is a highly positive protein. Okay, so that's when suddenly everything was starting to fall in place and we did some more analysis and it was definitely a disorder promoting, uh, sorry, dis uh, intrinsically disordered protein. And everything was very clear once we found this out. And that is because, as I told you, viral proteins, there are only a few handful of proteins and they have to interact with so many. And whenever you have a disordered protein or IDP, IDP has a very flexible, uh, what do you say, it doesn't have a very definitive three-dimensional structure. So if you have a definitive three-dimensional structures, the partners that you can bind are also limited. But when you have a protein that is very flexible, it can bind a lot of different partners and do its work. So that is what was telling. And intrinsically disordered proteins are very unstable. Their expression level is very much regulated. So everything was understood, okay. And uh, the literature also says that P30 has almost all 15 binding partners that we know. And I myself have discovered that it has more than 100 binding partners. So everything was making sense. So this was one of the uh, contributions that we made that was not known before that P30 is an IDP. Okay. So with that, coming back to the, my initial problem, while I was doing all these things during my postdoc also, I was trying to um, see if I don't answer a question, I get really uh, restless and I keep on doing that. So we finally cracked and found out the post-translation modifications. Okay, and again, this is a puzzle that is still un, uh, unanswered completely. So there are like 22 serines in this 241 amino acid protein. And out of those 22 serines, 11 series have more than 95%, what do you say, chances of getting phosphorylated by bioinformatic analysis. But when we did the analysis, only two serines we found were phosphorylated. Why? Maybe, but the thing is that those two serines that is the red one. The first red serine is definitely phosphorylated. Then there is a string of three serines. Out of this, one is phosphorylated. We don't know which one because the resolution of mass spec was not very good. So we, we say that one is phosphorylated. And somebody else has uh, identified phosphorylation on threonine that is in the uh, red color in the, at the end. So, and that is the um, uh, yellow color or brown color, you could say is the coverage of my mass spec of that protein, which is pretty good. And it covered all the 11 serines that were supposed to be phosphorylated. So, and the underlined region is the IDP region. And as expected, usually uh, phosphorylation or sites of phosphorylation are in IDP regions because phosphorylation can happen through lots of different kinases. Okay, so there has to be that flexibility so that, you know, four or five kinases can phosphorylate one serine. So we wanted to know, and it is also known that phosphorylation actually can affect the IDP nature. It can make it more rigid or more. So we want to know if these phosphorylations that we found, what effect do they have on the IDP nature of the protein? So all the bioinformaticians and computational biologists, you know, collaboration, you know, that is the whole idea of this uh, talk. So we can think about all those things and try to answer this question. I know that uh, P30 and HTLV do not have a lot of significance in India. That's the reason I'm trying to do something else here. And uh, it's like catch-22 situation when I write a grant saying that I want to do HTLV, they say that it is not relevant in India. When I say I'll do something in uh, Zika, they say you don't have experience in Zika. So it's like a catch-22 situation right now. <laughs> so, but anyways, so the thing is that uh, as a basic science question, it is a very, very important question is that IDP region is there. Serines are there, but they are not phosphorylated, and whatever phosphorylation is there, what is the effect of those phosphorylations on IDP by doing some computational uh, analysis? I'm definitely we can answer that question, and it will be a nice, uh, uh, what do you say, study to be done. And uh, she's my postdoc who has done most of that expression studies. Now she's an ORISE fellow in CDC in US. And uh, uh, this was my postdoc team, and uh, those are the funding agencies and my collaborators that I want to thank uh, before uh, ending this talk. And uh, any concerns, questions, comments are most welcome. Thank you very much. Again, I wanted to work on a virus that is more relevant to uh, uh, 
uh, Indian context and uh, my uh, immediate uh, plans are to work with Nipah virus and of course SARS-CoV-2. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, 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 you know, and even I'm uh, planning to write a collaborative grant with uh, Niper, uh, sorry, uh, Jipmer, sorry, Jipmer and uh, looking to see what will happen and uh, the idea is to establish a pseudo virus laboratory here and uh, viral pseudo typing and trying to test vaccines and all that stuff. So let's see how things go, you know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. To deliver the vote of thanks, let me invite Professor R. Rukumani, Head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, Pondicherry University. everybody. I'm extremely happy to propose the vote of thanks in this great occasion. At the outset, I would like to extend my heartiest thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh, for taking time out of his busy schedule to preside over this uh, inauguration ceremony. His clear ideas and envision for the future provide us the framework for making our university the best. His constant and relentless support has been a factor of encouragement for all of us uh, to make the impossible things possible. We are really thankful to God Almighty for giving us such a visionary as our leader, and I'm extremely thankful to him. A true leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Real leader makes an effort to help develop their team skills uh, so that they can reach their full potential. This seminar series is one such example of the efforts taken by our beloved Dean SLS, Professor Pratap Kumar Shetty, to make the School of Life Sciences leapfrog in achieving the vision of being the best. Thank you, sir, for creating such a wonderful forum for sharing and learning. I'm sure that we will see that your efforts yielding their fruits very soon. In learning, you will teach, and in teaching, you will learn. These are the words of Phil Collins. I believe learning is continuous from within and from outside. Peer learning removes hesitation and develops environment that is required to gain knowledge with greater participation. It provides various perspectives and multiple dimensions for understanding a singular element. I must record a proficient sense of gratefulness to our speakers for today for sharing us some of their finest achievement of their research work. I'm thankful to Dr. Govardhan Sahu and Dr. Rajneesh Anupam for their wonderful presentations and for sharing their perspectives. Thank you so much for providing such a great start to this seminar series. Now you have set a pace for the upcoming seminar. Thank you again. This seminar series will not be feasible without the constant support of our fellow colleagues in School of Life Sciences. I thank each and every one of our SLS faculty for their kind presence and encouragement. I would like to state that we are glad to have the participation of students from all the departments of School of Life Sciences. I hope that it has been a fruitful session for all of you, and I thank you all for your participation. Further, a big thanks to the support lent by the administrative staff and other technical support services of our university. I would like to place my hearty thanks to the campers, Ms. Silja and Ms. Shabnam, and other volunteers for making this seminar a breeze. See you all soon in the next upcoming SLS seminar. Till then, bye. Second Have a great Thursday evening. Yeah, it is second Thursday of November. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude today's session. I thank you all on behalf of the School of Life Sciences for your participation. I request you all to kindly rise for national anthem.
Yeah.